Hi, I'm Jeff Crawford from Crawford's Auto Repair in Mesa, Arizona. Welcome to my free classes on auto maintenance and repair. In this lesson, we're going to talk about general maintenance. We're going to use two cars for our demonstration. This is a 1997 Ford Mustang. This is a 2006 Scion XB. This vehicle has been loaned to us from Myrex Marketing for the purposes of producing this video. That's M-I-R-E-X marketing.com. Now we're going to go over here and we're going to go to the owner's manual and go to the um, vehicle maintenance. On this page here it shows you the locations and the type of fluids. They're all numbered as well as the location in a picture so that you can tell where to check your fluids, what type of fluids they are, and where they go. As well as there's more information in the, in the other areas of this book about the types of fluid and specifications. The service scheduled maintenance is in a separate book for this vehicle. Sometimes it's located in the owner's manual itself. But on this vehicle, scheduled maintenance is due every 5,000 miles. There's a breakdown of every item that you're supposed to inspect or replace, and when you're supposed to do it by date, or mileage, whichever comes first. Now we're going to go to the vehicle fluids. First we're going to go to the brake fluid. Brake fluid on most modern vehicles is going to be in a, a clear or transparent container so you can check the fluid without removing the cap. That's easy to do. Um, I'm going to shine a light on here so the fluid level will show up. Evidently you can see the fluid level is here. Clearly there's a maximum and a minimum line here. If your fluid level is between those two lines, everything is fine. You don't need to do anything else. If ever the flu brake fluid level is below the minimum line, that indicates that there's a hydraulic leak or that the brake pads have possibly worn out. At any rate, you would need to do a further investigation or take it into a shop and have that looked at if your brake fluid is low. You should never need to add brake fluid as a routine maintenance. It shouldn't go be out of the range of those two lines. Next, we're going to go to engine oil. Engine oil on this vehicle is, uh, as seen in the owner's manual, you, you check it with the dipstick. The dipstick is right here. You just remove the engine oil dipstick, wipe the oil clean with the engine off. We're going to reinsert the dipstick, remove it, check the oil level. You can see the oil level is right here. Now I'm going to wipe it off and I'm going to show you the markings on this dipstick so you can understand what they mean. This is also outlined in the owner's manual. Here's, it says full with an arrow, it points right to this dot, that's the, the maximum full line. Down here there's another little hole, it says add, that's the, anywhere between these two marks there are X's, that indicates the safe operating range, so if you're down to this add mark, you're going to need to add one quart of oil. If you're anywhere within this range, you're okay to drive and operate your vehicle. Uh, this vehicle's full of oil at this time, so we don't need to do anything. If it was low on oil, to add oil, we would remove this cap, use a funnel, and uh, pour the correct weight of oil. You can check that according to your temperature. In the owner's manual, you'd add oil through here. Next, we're going to go to the coolant. There's two methods of checking the coolant on this vehicle. You have to do them both together. Just checking one doesn't tell you that the, level, the system is full. For one, you have an overflow reservoir or an expansion tank. That's here. This is marked clearly with a full cold, full hot marks on it. We want to check the level of that. I'm going to shine a light through the plastic again. We can see that the level is about right here. Here's the full hot line, so we're, we're well within range. No coolant needs to be added. Now I'm going to check the, the coolant level in the radiator. You never want to open a radiator when the engine's hot. So there's two things I'm going to do. I'm going to feel the hose for temperature, and I'm going to squeeze it. If the hose is hard, that means there's pressure in the system, or if it's hot, you don't want to open this cap because hot coolant can, can come out of the system and burn you. To remove the radiator cap right here, we're going to press down firmly on the cap, rotate it to the left, it should come off easily. We remove this cap, 
you can see the uh, the fluid level is completely full and the condition is good so there's no reason to uh, go any further with the cooling system on this vehicle next we're going to go to power steering fluid power steering fluid is, uh, is located right here again you can find the locations in the owner's manual the cap is clearly labeled it says power steering fluid we're going to remove this cap it has a dipstick on it so we're going to wipe the dipstick off again reinsert the uh, the cap this is with the engine off remove it we can see that we're completely up to the full mark if you look at this much like the engine oil it has a range it says full hot it's supposed to be between here and here we're right up at the top full cold is is down here so um, at any rate there's plenty of power steering fluid in here no need to add anything if the power steering fluid level was indicating low that would indicate that there's a leak the fluid should not go away on its own if, if it's low you want to check for any kind of leaks and repair that yourself or have it repaired at a repair facility uh, next we're going to go to windshield washer fluid windshield washer fluid we're going to go over here to the uh, Scion XB it has a, a clear windshield washer reservoir right here it does have a full line down there at the bottom it's actually a little bit low so we're going to top it off with fluid um, I have some windshield washer fluid here we just remove this cap and pour some fluid in. We shouldn't need a funnel. Hopefully I can uh, hit the hole here. And you can fill this. The, the fill level is slightly below the top of the lid, but you can fill it all the way up. There, it's completely full now. It wasn't very low. We're going to want to replace the lid. You can see now that the fluid level is blue. It's all the way up to the top. Um, that's how you top off and check the uh, windshield washer fluid. Next, we're going to go to transmission fluid. On this Scion XB, it's a manual transmission, so it's not going to have a dipstick or any way to check the transmission fluid from the top of the vehicle. In order to check the transmission fluid on this vehicle, we would have to raise it up on a lift or go underneath it with the car supported on jack stands properly. Uh, remove a level plug and a fill plug. That plug is uh, typically in the side of a manual transmission. You fill it up until the level of the fluid is equal with the bottom of the fill hole. Um, on this vehicle over here, it's an automatic transmission. We're going to go over here. I'll show you how to properly check the fluid level on an automatic transmission. On most automatics, you're going to check the fluid with the engine running. That does vary per vehicle. The dipstick for the automatic transmission on this vehicle is located right here. You can see that it's labeled trans fluid and it tells you the type of fluid to use on the dipstick. So we're going to, we're going to remove this dipstick. Normally this would be done with the engine running. It's not running now because it would make a lot of noise on our video. We're going to wipe the dipstick off. I'm going to show you the markings on this dipstick. It has an H here and a bunch of X marks. That means when the fluid is hot, the fluid level should be between here and here. Anywhere in that range is fine. You wouldn't need to add fluid. Over here we have a C. That's for cold. So if the engine's cold with it running, you're going to want the fluid level to be between, be between here and here. If it's in that range, it's, accept, it's acceptable. After you've wiped it off, the engine's running again in park. We're going to insert the dipstick back into the dipstick tube. Remove it. And then we're going to view the fuel, fluid level. Clearly on this vehicle, the fluid level is showing above the maximum mark. That's because the engine's not running. Uh, again, we're not running the engine at this time. I know the fluid level is correct. I've already checked it. I'm just demonstrating the proper procedure. So the fluid level is full and clean. We're going to reinstall the dipstick. Put it in the tube, insert it all the way. That's how you check the transmission fluid. Now, we also have done, demonstrated a proper uh, transmission service where we removed the pan on our website and replaced the filter and refilled it with new transmission fluid. You can see that at www.crawfordsautoservice.com. Um, next we're going to go to the battery. There are a number of things that you want to inspect on the battery. First we're going to start with a simple visual inspection. You can see both battery terminals on this vehicle. They're clean. They don't have any white or green corrosion on them so the terminals look good. They're both tight. I'm going to try to wiggle them. Neither terminal is loose. Um, so the battery 
terminals and connections are good. Next we're going to check the fluid and level up in, uh, in the battery. The fluid level on this battery, because it's black, we're going to have to remove the caps to check it. To do that, you just take a small screwdriver, insert underneath the cap, pry the top off. We're going to look into all of these holes. Each one of these holes is a different cell on the battery. If there's a difference in them, any of the fluid levels, that could indicate that one of the cells is going bad on the battery. On this battery, all the fluid levels are equal and they're completely full, as you can see, so there's no problem there. We're going to reinstall these caps. Next, we're going to perform a load test on the battery and a voltage test to make sure it's up to par there. So here we have a battery load tester and a voltage tester. It has a red, red lead. We're going to connect that to the plus or the positive on the battery. The black one's going to go to the negative. As you can see, battery voltage is around 12.5 volts. That's, that's perfect voltage for a fully charged battery. Now I'm, gonna, I'm going to put a 130 amp load by depressing this switch for 10 seconds, maximum of 15. So we're going to hold this down and we're going to watch that needle. You see it's maintaining around 11 volts under a load. This is a 130 amp load. We're going to count to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You can see it maintained 11 volts that whole time. Here's what we did with that voltage and amperage. We generated a bunch of heat through a heating element. Um, the batteries returned back to 12.5 volts before it's fully charged and it's working properly. So there's no further service needed on this battery. Next we're going to go on to inspecting belts and hoses. Again, we're going to use the Mustang for inspecting the belts and hoses. Um, the, to, to check the, be the belt, we're going to want to look at the back side of the belt, check for any cracking, check the top side of the belt for any cracking or fraying around the sides. I don't see any problem with this belt. Now over here I have a belt that is uh, in poor condition that we just replaced. I saved it for this video so we could show you. Here, here are two belts. Now if I bend this over this way, you can, you can clearly see there are large cracks in that belt. This belt was severely damaged and needed to be replaced. I replaced this just the other day. To inspect the cooling system hoses, we're going to do a visual inspection. We're going to look for any signs of leaks around the clamps or swelling around the hose. A real typical area that you're going to see swelling would be here near the clamp or right here near the clamp. Uh, the hoses on this vehicle I'm squeezing them. They, they're pretty solid. They don't have any, they would be really soft or swollen appearance when they're damaged. Visually, all the hoses on this vehicle look good. Um, that's basically all we need to do to inspect the cooling system hoses. There are some heater hoses back here as well. As you can see, there's no large swollen spots. The hoses appear to be in good condition and uh, no need for service at this time. Next we're going to go to fuses. Fuses are, are easily accessed on this vehicle. I'll show you on both vehicles how we can look at the fuses. Here's a fuse box. You, you lift on this, this and this tab. You can remove the cover. There are a number of fuses there. They're all color coded as well as numbers. The numbers indicate how much amperage they're capable of drawing before they blow. To test a fuse with a test light, this is a simple 12 volt test light. When power is present, the light will light up. To test a fuse, there are two metal tabs that protrude through the backside. These are the larger fuses. We're going to demonstrate on, on this fuse. They're the same here. So you touch the end of the test light to there. Notice it lights up. Here it lights up. That's a good fuse. If the fuse was blown, I would only have power on one side. When I touched over here, it would not light up. I'm not actually touching, but I'm demonstrating. If I was touching that contact, it did not light here, and it lights here. That indicates the fuse is blown. We can also simply remove a fuse. If you don't have a test light, you can grab the fuse like this, wiggle it back and forth while you're pulling it out. Now we can see here that the element inside of this fuse is all intact and not burnt. If the element was burned, we would see an open contact here, and typically you'll see a black burn spot on the, on the plastic as well. 
when you have a blown fuse. I'm going to reinstall this fuse now. The fuses in this car are all good. I will demonstrate how to, how to test a small fuse and we'll show you what they look like too. So here, small fuse, lights on both sides. You, you, again, you can remove the fuse, you can look at it, you can visually see that the element is not damaged at all. So I'm going to reinstall this fuse. That's all there is to checking fuses. If you're having a problem with something electrical on your car not working, again, go to the owner's manual. It'll tell you where the fuse for each item is located. Next we're going to go over to the XB. We're going to demonstrate the fuses on this car. They're, they're a little bit harder to see. Um, but then again, this, this is the one of the fuse boxes on this car. There are, there are several. There's probably some inside the vehicle as well. Those would be harder to demonstrate. So we're going to demonstrate on this one out here. These fuses are a little smaller and harder to see. They still operate the same way. I'm going to take the test light. I have it connected to the negative side of the battery just to make sure it's hooked up correct. A simple test. You can uh, touch it to the positive. The light lights up. Now we know that we have the test light correctly connected. We're going to check a fuse here. That fuse is good on that side. And on that side, that means we have a good fuse. Now this vehicle comes with a fuse puller because these small fuses are hard to pull out. If you look right here, this is a fuse puller. I'm just going to remove that. This is what it looks like. You can take this, put it over top of a fuse like that, squeeze it, and pull. It pulls the fuse right out and you can hold it. Now if you look at the element, inside this fuse it's clearly intact and not burnt so there's nothing wrong with these fuses we're going to reinstall it you just to reinstall you just put it in the hole and press it in with your finger now we're going to reinstall the fuse cover that's how you test and replace a fuse again there are a number of fuse boxes in the vehicle the location and the amperage and what the fuses operate can be found in your owner's manual next we're going to go to vehicle light Okay, now we're going to demonstrate how to check the, uh, the warning lights inside the car. They're, they're easily visible and it, whenever you put the key in and turn the key on, all of the warning lights will come on for a brief time, maybe five seconds, so that you can verify all those lights are working. That doesn't indicate a problem. So we're going to go ahead and turn the key on. You're going to see all the warning indicator lights come on at once. There you go. You can see all the lights. You see that most of them shut off. A short time it went through its lamp test mode now we're going to start the vehicle all the lights will shut off with the exception of a seat belt and door ajar lights because we have the door open I'm going to start the vehicle now uh, the brake light is remaining on that's because of the parking brake I remove the parking brake that shuts off and the doors are open the small blue light is a cold temperature light that's because the vehicle's not warmed up that's a feature that this vehicle has. It's not on all vehicles. Uh, we can see that all the lights have shut off that should have shut off and that they're all working when the key is on and an engine is off. So at this time, we're gonna step out of the vehicle and we're gonna test all the exterior lights. Okay, we're gonna start out in the front of the vehicle. I'm gonna have you, I have an assistant inside the car, my son Jacob. If you'd please turn on the headlights. Okay, we can see we have two orange side marker lights, two headlights. Let's try the high beams. Both high beams are working good. Now let's go to a left turn. We can see we have a left turn signal bulb working as well as on this vehicle, there's a small turn signal on the side. That's, that's illuminating as well. Now we're gonna try a right turn. You can see we have right turn is working and the, the marker on the side is working. All the lights in the front of this vehicle are working at this time, so we're going to walk around the back and check the uh, rear lights. We'll start out with the tail lights. Please turn on the tail lights. Okay, you can see we have an equal number of bulbs. There's one bulb on the left, one on the right for the tail lights. There are two license plate lights. They're all illuminated and clear. Um, let's try the brake lights next. Okay, you can see that both of the lights have gotten brighter, so we have two brake lights, one on the right, one on the left. We also have a third high mount brake light that's working as well. Okay, you can release the brake. Let's try the left turn. You can see we clearly have a left turn signal working. Now we're gonna try the right turn signal. 
right turn signal is working. We go ahead and turn on the hazard lights. As you can see, we have two flashing hazard lights. We're gonna to have to walk around the front of the vehicle one more time just to do that. I should have done the hazards while I was up there. You can see we have a side marker blinking. We have two amber lights in the front blinking for our hazards, as well as the additional side marker is blinking. Uh, that concludes the exterior light test on this vehicle. All the lights are working properly, so there's no need for repair. Okay, we're gonna demonstrate checking or replacing the air filter on the Scion XP. Um, we're gonna, it's gonna require a couple tools. For one, there's a clamp holding the, the air inlet hose to the filter housing on. We're gonna have to remove that clamp. I'm gonna use an electric tool. You could use a screwdriver or a 10 millimeter socket. Um, we'll just loosen that. We're then gonna grab the hose pull it off the air filter housing. You can't remove the air filter housing without removing this hose and properly check the air filter. There are two clips, one here, one over here. You can't see the other one, it's the same. You just pull back on that clip, pull back on this clip. That's released that air filter housing. Now we're gonna lift on the front of it, pull it forward. Now this is the side of the air filter that would get dirt on it. You can clearly see there's some debris in there, but not much. I'll remove it, you can compare the side. There's the clean side of the air filter. The air filter's in good condition here. We're just gonna reinstall it. It's gonna be easiest to put it in here because of gravity. Install it like that. I'm gonna again, take the air filter housing with the front part lifted up. There's clips in the back here. See these clips? They have to go underneath here for proper installation. This is often not done properly and it causes damage to the uh, air, air box and it allows dirt to enter the engine. So I've, I've clipped it under the back side, now I'm gonna press the front down. I'm gonna push this clip up, push this clip up. I'm gonna reinstall the air inlet hose. I'm gonna tighten that bolt. It doesn't need to be very tight. Um, That's tight enough. A good indication is if you look at the threads on the bolt, you can see that I've tightened it right to the same location it was before we, uh, we started here. But hand tight with a screwdriver is plenty sufficient there. That concludes this lesson for general maintenance. We hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for watching.